We have several people here today whom I asked to say a few words, and they all agreed. So we're going to hear from three, uh, actually four people. The first is Mr. Michael Smith. Michael Smith uh, may be a very common name, but there is nothing common about this Michael Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith is an energy entrepreneur whose academic and business roots are here in Colorado. He attended CSU in the 1970s, majoring in chemistry with a minor in mathematics. He received the Doctorate of Humane Letters from CSU in 2008. He is the chairman and chief executive of Freeport LNG, which is completing a liquid natural gas export facility based in Freeport, Texas. I had the opportunity to tour uh, the facility, and I, I can't even express how massive it is. It is it, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, it's so impressive. Uh, the operations are impressive, and it's all because of this Michael Smith with a common name. So Michael told me much about his, his success, and he said a lot of it is due to his education at CSU, and some is just due to luck and chance. Well, as Louis Pasteur, a chemist and microbiologist, once said, chance favors the prepared mind. Mr. Smith is clearly a prepared mind. The breadth and reach of the generosity from Michael and his wife Iris to CSU is unparalleled. Their gifts created the Michael and Iris Smith Alumni Center, the Michael Smith Natural Resources Building, which is going to have its uh, celebrating the grand opening of it tomorrow afternoon, so you should all uh, stop by for that. And he established 70 full tuition undergraduate scholarships at CSU, 10 of which are the Michael Smith Scholars here in the department, our Department of Chemistry. I wanna thank him for believing in and investing in the university and for his continued commitment to excellence for Colorado State University students and certainly the College of Natural Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Michael Smith. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Dean Neger, for your kind comments, and uh, thank you for your invitation to speak at uh, today's uh, luncheon for the College of Natural Science and um, for what is the 50th year anniversary of the college. Um, the, um, I actually uh, was not here 50 years ago, 45 years ago, uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for uh, those people protesting, because in 73, we were drinking in the Ramscolor. <laughs> so, um, for you, some of your old time folks in the chemistry department, it's interesting, I, uh, I, I, I tend to wait to the last minute for some stuff, and I was working on this speech last night at close to midnight, and I was had in the background classic rock on, which is what I love to listen to, and I was, just as I was finishing, I could not believe that I was listening to Room to Move by John Mayall, who, um, who uh, our esteemed chemistry professor, who was my professor, uh, uh, Dr. Thompson, was the bass player on that, on that album, which is a very famous song in the 60s. So anyway, um, but looking back, on life 50 years ago, not on the campus, but in 1968, the internet was just a concept that actually started with four sites the following year. 32 kilobytes of memory cost $8,000, and now you can get a hard drive with about 30,000 times that memory for less than $100. Most cancers were death sentences, and now most cancers are curable. Biochemists were just in the embryonic stage of studying DNA, which was only discovered 15 years earlier, and now we have genetically engineered drugs and foods. All of these amazing developments have come from computer science, chemistry, biology, biochemistry, which are all part of the College of Natural Sciences. The world is a very different place now than it was 50 years ago. The advances in science and technology has changed the way we live and work. We no longer need to go to a store uh, 
we can go buy it online. We don't need to own a car, we can call Uber. We don't need to buy a, a record album or call a travel agent to make reservations. These are all benefits of disruptive technology that serves as the foundation for an entirely new and exciting industries and has reduced the, the cost of living for everyone. Of course, with these new wonderful technologies comes consequences. Millions of jobs have been lost, businesses close, but new efficient businesses get started. This disruptive economy is affecting every business and industry. And this evolution is only accelerating. Fortunately for you, in the natural sciences, your fields of study is leading many of these changes. Your, uh, but make no mistake that whatever career path you make, there will be massive changes to the way you conduct your work on a day-to-day -day basis. And you need to embrace these changes by doing what our species has done better than any other organism on this planet. You must adapt and change. As Charles Darwin would probably agree, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who succeed, but those who can best manage the disruptive challenges of change. Adaptation is, is not just about survival for our species. For all of the students here today, it's a matter of success and progress. In my 40 years of professional work, I've been fortunate enough to have four different careers during that period. Most people only have one career. To do this, I had to adapt to change to learn new concepts and practices. It's not easy starting over, especially as you get older. But if I hadn't embraced the changes and the new challenges that came with them, I never would have been able to progress from a local real estate industry here in Fort Collins to the global energy sector, where today my small company will enter the ranks next year as the seventh largest LNG producer in the world, right behind behemoths like Shell, Exxon, and the country of Qatar. Now I'll spare you my life story and business, but I hope I can personally identify a few themes of adaptation that can I pass on to you with the goal that you too can experience personal and professional success just as I have. One of the first things that's necessary for successfully adapting to changes in the life and the business world is that once you've done your homework, once you've analyzed the road ahead and you've decided to chart a new course with a new job or career, you, real, you need to realize you're going to be the weakest person in your field and you need to swim and keep up with the other fish or natural, natural selection will do you in. To that point, when I started in the oil and gas industry, I had no prior experience in the field, but I utilized my education, as Jan said, in chemistry and in mathematics that I learned here at CSU, and I drove, dove into the technical aspects of the business, and I learned it rather quickly. Basically, I adapted my prior education to my new business. You shouldn't be afraid of going into something that is not exactly what you learned in school. You can use your education in many different ways to succeed in, the, in this rapidly changing world. Now that all sounds easy when, it's, when I say it like that, but in order to successfully adapt to change, you have to know how to take measured risks in life, be able to analyze opportunities, and conceptual ideas for their inherent value and for the potential pitfalls before venturing into liquefied natural gas, or as we call it, LNG. Some 16 years ago, I had no idea what, we, what it even was. So my understanding and analysis of importing LNG started from a blank slate. For those of you who are like me, when I started in LNG, and you're not familiar what liquefied natural gas is, it's basically natural gas 
that's been super cool to minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And at 260 degrees Fahrenheit, it changes state from a gas to a liquid, just like water does from a liquid to a solid. And as it changes phase, it shrinks 600 times. Think of a beach ball going down to the size of a marble. You can fit a hell of a lot more marbles in a big ship than you can beach balls. <laughs> and that's how LNG moves from countries with excess gas to countries that don't have the gas. We load it on massive tankers that are like huge floating thermoses as big as the largest cruise ships in the world from points in, in around the world like the U.S. Gulf Coast where Freeport is and places like Qatar and Australia. And the ships set sail for customers in uh, countries that are deficient in natural resources like Japan, South Korea, China, and India. And that not only need energy, but they want clean burning natural gas instead of dirty coal or oil. Today, LNG is one of the biggest capital endeavors in the entire energy industry, and it's leading the fossil fuel industry in reducing CO2 emissions. Now, I had to do extensive research on LNG before I started Freeport LNG. After selling my oil and gas business in 2001, I was convinced that the U.S. was starting to run out of natural gas, that essentially our gas reserves were declining too, too fast to keep up with demand. And despite all of this, I, I came to the conclusion that the United States was going to keep demanding cleaner burning natural gas for fuel, for power generation, to, to re reduce our dependence on dirty coal. So at that point, I concluded that developing a new LNG import terminal for the United States was a valuable business plan and would help provide a country with a secure energy source. The point is, all my convictions were based on studying the data, building a business plan around sound analytical research. No matter what you do, establishing a comprehensive business plan based on analytical research is a must for starting any new venture and adapting to changes in your life. In order to be adaptive, you don't have to be the first person to foresee a change or conceptualize a new innovation. In other words, conceiving the design for scientific experiment or a newly engineered product is only one of the ingredients for success. Ideas are, in fact, a dime a dozen. What matters is being able to execute a good plan at the right time and do it in a timely fashion. Freeport LNG was started because someone else had the idea to build the first LNG import facility in 20 years in the United States, but failed. After years of marketing the project, they were close to bankruptcy when I took it over. It needed more than money. It needed the right team to execute the right plan to navigate the first import license in over 25 years, while at the same time getting customers and financing a, so we could finance a billion dollar facility. I combined my energy experience and my prior real estate background to do what no one else had seen. Now, I had mentioned before that we had come to the conclusion back in 2002 that the United States needed to import natural gas by means of LNG. However, no one knew at the time, only five years later, a disruptive technology was going to come along um, and that would make our plant uh, so that it was not going to even be used. And I'm talking about shale gas and shale oil. Fortunately, we developed a business with long-term customers and had a successful operation. But it's clear that our terminal was not going to be utilized for its intended purpose to import LNG. The United States had more gas than it knew what to do with. The new era 
of, 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 of gas was ushered in through hydraulic fracking and our company needed ways to adapt to this change. Jan mentioned we're building this massive export project. It's bigger than this entire campus. Um, the idea to export natural gas from the United States as LNG was actually my competitor's idea, who also had a large import facility that wasn't being used. My team and I deliberated, and we considered this to be an excellent opportunity for the company. Our prior experience with LNG imports taught us that we needed to have first mover advantage. We were the second company to file for export permits, and eventually 25 others followed. We were the second company to sign long-term customers who committed to billions of dollars of exports, which enabled us to secure the financing to construct this $14 billion export facility. We were the third company to start construction in 2014, and now we are one year away from starting production of what will be the third largest LNG export project in the entire world. Out of the 25 plus facilities that applied for federal permit approval, only five succeeded in reaching the goal of beginning construction before oil prices crashed and before their construction could begin. And the first, so there were only five that made it in the first wave of LNG export projects. It was my conviction that we had a unique opportunity with outstanding economics that would not be there very long if we didn't move so quickly. It was one thing to have a great idea for business. It's another thing to talk about it. But the, the key is to go out and seize the opportunity before it disappears. I can't emphasize more. Great opportunities never last very long in anything. Never forget that. The LNG industry has been an exciting passion of mine for the last 16 years. It has taught me what, really, what it really means to be an adaptive businessman, one who's always prepared to chart a new course in life. As you launch your careers after CSU, I hope you're all successful in adapting to the, uh, I'm sorry, screw it up the end. I hope you're all successful in adapting to the amazing new advancements we see in society. The changes are happening faster and faster. So you need to be ready. Embrace these changes and you can be the next leader in whatever you choose. Thank you very much.